Did you hit the button? I did just hit the button. All right, let me actually start a timer this time. I keep telling myself I'm going to do it, and then I don't do it. Really need it for this show, Dana. I wrote down time durations for each segment so that we this isn't a two-hour show. Yeah, well, it's probably a good and idea. It's this show has a pre-pre-show and a pre-show. <laughs> Going one level deeper than usual. Yep. So I don't know if you want to play the intro after the pre-pre-show or after the pre-show. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm going to let you let you sort that okay. out. Yeah, I think we're just going to have to feel it out, see how, see what happens. We shot a music video this week. Yes. And there was somebody doing some BTS stuff at this music video. And they were using what looked like a 2003 Nikon cool pics. <laughs> I think I did see that. And I was like, is that a cool pics? Or is that like the Canon camera? Cause I can't remember what the Canons were called. And the person said they were shooting home videos. And it reminded me of that YouTuber who made that video about having a vibe cam and how it's important that, you know, sometimes like if you're just recording memories and you just want to let it roll, you know, get a vibe cam. Just uh, shoot on like a like a JVC camcorder from 2005. Like quality doesn't matter. You're just looking for those vibes. Like you're not trying to capture what happened. You're trying to capture the feeling. I don't. I don't know about this. It's, and uh, it's, I don't know. So this person who was shooting on their like shooting all their video with their 2003 Nikon cool pics. I was I was like, man, those vibes are going to be real strong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I saw it being held vertically, too. Yeah, but <laughs> it's, it's all for the gram. Weird. Yes, yes. I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of understand the mentality behind that, but at the same time, it, it seems like it, it introduces this whole extra step of getting footage off of it that you wouldn't have with your phone, and I don't that may be a problem for the intended purpose. I'm I'm in, I'm here for it. I know that. Whenever, well, you already have a JVC camera too, so it's you're, got a gash you're in the lens and everything. I'm perfect. ready. I mean, you have that old like Kodak flip. Mm -hmm. Those yeah. things were fun. I haven't I haven't seen those come back. Like, where are the Kodak flips? Well, there was that Canon PowerShot G10 or something. That's the well, that's closest. A, that was like the new one, right? Yeah, they yeah. just came out. No, I mean people don't. You mean an actual flip? People yeah. don't want that, Daniel. People want it to look bad <laughs> so it looks good. Uh, You'd have to get like an actual 2009 Kodak Flip. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I haven't seen those come back. I mean, where are they? Maybe that's what I should take when we go on this uh, this Europe vacation we're going on. Yeah, Maybe I should yeah. just only take that camera. I don't see why you wouldn't. <laughs> it would be perfect. It would. It would. You would capture all the vibes. Yep. You know, back then whenever I was shooting everything in 480p on my JVC HDD mm -hmm. 30x whatever camcorder Evo Evorio something it was blue I mean it I I, I wanted I mean nice to have better quality sure. you know you go back and you watch you go boy that 1080p stuff looks real yeah. good and you you wanted it to look better but now it's like you want it to look worse yep. now you and want your pixels are we going is this going to come full circle is what i'm saying is I feel like the answer is no, but are all of these people who are way cooler than me who are shooting on their vibe cams going to come back to this five years later and say, boy, I sure wish all of this super sick footage that looks freaking awesome was higher resolution. <laughs> I, you know, I, I kind of think so, personally. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, you know, it's it's cool in the moment, but ultimately, you know, as screens get better and just as our standards get higher for what we think is good video i do think that if, if eventually it's going to be it's going to it's going to stop feeling nostalgic and just be like oh i can't actually see this because the pixels are enormous but daniel how do you see a feeling <laughs> <laughs> it's too deep <laughs> okay speaking of seeing a feeling yep intro do 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 pre-show <laughs> I scanned my photos. You did. I did it. Last, you finally got it done. Last episode, probably, I complained about how hard scanning was. Mm -hmm. And I did, I did it. It took way, way too long. Like, way too long. Yeah, you kind of started telling me a little bit about it, and it, I was shocked at how complicated this process seemed to be. And But I think that now that I've done it once, I think maybe, like, within an hour, I can get everything scanned next time for 36 pictures. But... Where I landed on this is that 
the built the software that you can get not built in the software you can download for your Epson scanner mm-hmm. is like only okay like it's not very good and there's better options out there and one of which is silverfast which is has the worst learning curve that software is makes no sense like a learning cliff a lot like it well like once you get it you're like okay i i kind of understand what i'm doing silverfast 8 is free with the scanner you just have to know where to look for the link on the website and then like you punch in your model number and you get Silverfast 8 and then you can upgrade it for free to Silverfast 9. Wow. Which is the current version of Silverfast. So I now have a copy of Silverfast 9 installed on my computer and I use it to that to finally scan the photos. So I've been scanning it like a bunch of different ways trying to figure out the best way to handle this. I Silverfast I think is maybe the right choice for me right now. I think that there's a, a few different film convert plugins into Lightroom Classic that are better and people have shown like, hey, oh, here's a side by side and this was with Silverfast and this was with this other thing. And I'm like, wow, that other thing's just way better. The problem is you'd have to I'd have to like still scan it with Silverfast to like get the negative and then bring the negative into Lightroom, I think, because mm-hmm. I don't think those plugins in Lightroom function as the scanning software. Oh, so it's like an extra step. Maybe. I probably should double check this. I'm not going to, I don't know if that's 1000% correct, but I think that's the case. And I stopped using Lightroom Classic because, well, do we need to rehash my photo backup workflow? No, not right now. Okay. We don't have, we, you, you've, you've allotted four minutes for this section. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, we're already behind. It says eight, that's eight minutes. And no, yeah, because that's nine. Oh, boy. Seven minutes. And we're at, we have eight seconds. You better get going. Oh, jeez. Okay. Where was I? <laughs> right. I stopped using Lightroom Classic because I went I went full Lightroom. Sure. And I'm 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 not I don't want to pay for Lightroom Classic or Lightroom Regular because I'm trying to be like full like just a regular Lightroom person and using all the whole Adobe stuff. And as far as the cloud and like singing back to the cert, well boy, I shouldn't get into it. Point is to save myself ten bucks a month, I stopped paying for Lightroom Classic and now I'm just paying for regular Lightroom. And so I can't use the plugins. Because I don't have Lightroom Classic. Mm, Oh, so the plugins only work in Classic. Yeah, I don't think you can get plugins for Lightroom Regular. Okay, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of dumb. I need I need all these plugins in regular Lightroom, specifically on the iPad version because I've gone almost completely to editing photos on my iPad, and I love it. It's so much fun. You use the pencil, and I'm like doop 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 doop. Love it. It's worse. Like Lightroom is worse on the iPad versus the computer. Like you just have more features, even in like regular Lightroom. And I don't understand why. It's like literally the same processor. Like, why can't I have all of the features on the iPad version? I just don't get it. I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah, that's a little unfortunate. I wonder if it has to do with like how things run in the background. Anyways, I use Silverfast 9. And you can like pre-scan and then you can you can create yeah, like you can create a crop like a crop or a clip around the photo that you want to scan. Like here's the area I want to scan, and you can set all of the settings. And so you have like Scan is color positive or color negative. You can do like presets of different films that are included. And there isn't a preset, obviously, for Phoenix 200, which was kind of made the whole process a little weird because I had to do a lot of experimenting to find out what looked better. Which, for all of our shooters out here, shooting Phoenix 200 and using Silverfast to scan, I don't know what you're doing, but what I did is I, I scanned it as linear because basically you, you pick a film a film type and like the way the emulsions blah blah on the scanning you don't necessarily want to scan as like zero to a hundred you you want it to have some sort of curve to it like if you're looking at your your you know light from zero to a hundred on a like a histogram or whatever what are those what are those linear scopes called or like you're using like a line graph to edit your photos um I mean, I've seen them called curves, I guess. I guess that is what I don't know. Call if you, you you can use the it, there's curves like pre-built curves or if you're using Kodak Gold 200 mm-hmm. or Porta 400 or whatever. And I found that I uh, because Phoenix 200 is so crunchy that if I used any of the presets other than just scan it, scanning it straight linear, I lost too much shadow detail. And it just didn't quite mm. look right. Lost a little bit too much on the low end. Yeah. And so like I found a set of settings that worked for the Phoenix 200 stuff, which was linear and then like 
a little bit of exposure correction. And so I basically did all of the normal stuff that I would do. Like if I received scans from the lab, I might go through the scans and like tweak the contrast a little bit, do some like minor exposure or warmth edits on my films, film scans. Uh, basically I did all of that in Silverfast mm. at scan time. Interesting. And so, so you kind of baked that into the yeah, profile. basically, and so like that's one piece that added a lot of time. And then whenever I was done scanning everything, I went through it in Lightroom again and like did final adjustments. Mm. That's a lot of work. It was like it's way too much work, Daniel. Because <laughs> like that whole process is like I would do that with with raw files. I would edit them in Lightroom, and now I'm editing them in Lightroom. And I'm still I'm shooting them, developing them, scanning them, editing them, and then editing them again. That's exhausting. This is it's way too much work. Yeah, like nobody. No, what was a uh, um, Becca from the Verge said something on a podcast I listened to recently. There was something about like everything about shooting film is like torturous and arduous and awful. I can't remember exactly what you said, but it's like nobody nobody should do this. It's like if you shoot film, you're a masochist. It's not going to stop you though, right? Like you're, I, you're definitely still. I keep just doing it. the process is fun and enjoyable and it's like this is rewarding but also like the pictures look worse <laughs> and it's it's exhausting and it takes forever and it's just like oh boy no one should ever shoot film welcome back to the camera gear podcast i'm daniel and i'm lucas and we're here today to talk about the gear software and techniques we use to shoot photos and video Okay, so the big takeaways were make sure that the film is like clean because I scan so much hair. And I don't know, I think that was it. I think that I'm like ready. I'm ready for the next 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 roll. Well, I guess we'll see how the next one goes. Before the next roll, I have to light seal my cameras. Or really just one of them. At the, and I bought light seal to like replace. It's just so degraded in the other mm. camera. Yeah, yeah. Which reminds me. That they, in, they came out with a new Instax 99. Yeah. Yeah, they did. Yeah, that's not even on the topic list here. But you have to talk about it. Uh, but there's a new Fuji, Fujifilm Instax camera. It only shoots on film. Like some of these Instax will let you shoot digitally and then you can like push the lever to shoot on film. Oh, and I didn't realize this one was different. Yeah, the Instax 99 is film only. And those are like a dollar a shot. But the reason I bring it up is because one of the modes for the Instax is you can have a light bleed effect. So normally in film photography, one thing you don't want is light bleed. But the Instax 99 has a feature where there is a physical LED inside the camera that will flash to create false light bleed inside the camera on the film. And I think you can even choose the color, right? I think there are actually the, I think there are actually multiple colors you well, can choose from. You can choose the white balance color, which gives like different shades of like look, so you can like get different tints of film. But the, I think the light the light bleed thing is is actually different. Okay. Than okay. just like the color things, you can change the colors. You can change the simulations if you want to call it that. You can there's a physical aperture thing on the very front of it. Yeah, to for create, the vignette. Yeah, to create vignette where it literally adds like physical shutter for vignetting. And then you can have a flash of light inside on the corner to give it light bleed. That whole camera is so ridiculous, but I can't help but appreciate how ridiculous it is. It's not just that, like, you shoot you shoot with, like, a, you know, an X-T5 or something. Maybe, like, you specifically. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Uh, hypothetically, but yes. Yeah, it's, or you know, or maybe the general you. You shoot with an mm-hmm. X-T5. Like, you're going to shoot in, you know, Rela or Cosachrome or ProNet or whatever. And, like, those are, they're, like, looks. But the, the Instax 99 looks... Or just ways to make your photos look bad. Yeah. Yeah. Like pretty much. Just just like, you know how when you shoot on film, sometimes the white balance is wrong and everything comes out green and you don't want that? What if you did that on purpose? <laughs> it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, I mean, it's just like that vibe cam we were talking about. Yeah. So sometimes I think maybe I should just take the leather back off of my Minolta. Yeah, man. And instead of replacing the light seals, like maybe just get like chisel out what's left yeah. of them. Yeah. Or, you know, bring a flashlight with you and just shine it at the camera. Uh, just right. Or like, man, I just shine it at the back of the camera every so often. Yeah. You know, get some of those. Yeah. Get some of that light bleed in there. Yeah, there you go. That's what people want. You know, I mean, I got to say, though, it's kind of like practical effects in a movie. Like, 
I kind of I kind of respect that their way of doing a vignette is putting actual aperture blades in front of the picture. I mean, it's it's, cool. it's printing it straight to film. There is no digital sensor in this thing. It is yeah. going straight to the film. It's a film camera. Like it's a legit a film camera. So how else are you going to do it if not physically? I think it's great. It is ridiculous. <laughs> I just I think of like what if, what if you went back to like 1985 and someone's shooting on the Polaroid and you're like, you know how you, sometimes your Polaroids don't look good? Well, we made them knock even not more good. <laughs> <laughs> on purpose. <laughs> we we had the technology to make this picture perfect. And instead, we decided to put an LED in the camera so it would be even worse. And just vibe, vibe camming all over the place. <laughs> that that <laughs> thing is nuts, man. I think it's great. I don't know if it's out yet, but it's going to be two hundred dollars. Yeah, two hundred bucks, and it's it's a coming. Yeah, and they're, they're going to sell like hotcakes. Yes, they are. The teens are just going to love it. Yep. Okay. I may have alluded to earlier, and like really, you know, my original plan for this whole show is we were, we're going to go through the intro, and I was going to be like, Daniel, you need to explain to everybody why I'm mad at you. <laughs> well, I don't really know what happened. I mean, we were we were doing this film shoot that I think we're going to talk about, you know, briefly in a little bit. Um. And you were kind of setting up the gimbal, getting the lens together, and I handed you a camera and said, you should use this one. And you just got angry. And I don't know why. Can't figure it out. You're like, I didn't throw the camera. (laughs) (laughs) Just drop it on the ground. Oh, boy. You ever like, you're like, are window shopping for a new bike when you're 12? And you're like, I want that one. It's a red. It's got tassels on it. It's got a bell. I'm going to get that thing. I'm going to put a card in the wheel spokes. Yep. Oh, yeah. That thing's so cool. You like go cruise over to your best bud's house and you're like, let me tell you about this super sweet bike that I want. And they're like, oh, you want a new bike? I got a new bike. (laughs) Exact same bike. That's how you feel. (laughs) Is that how you really feel? (laughs) Just tell the people, Daniel. I can't even. So I got an (laughs) X-T5. You know, we we were talking recently about this upcoming trip we have and wanting, you know, a good camera to, to take on the trip and, you know, going overseas and going to see some cool stuff. And I mean, we're camera podcasters. Got to have a good camera, right? Yeah. And I or, was, a, or a bad camera. Or Yes. Yes. There's no in between. Either but, a purposely bad camera or a purposely good and camera. And I think it's fair to say that right now you're smack in the middle, Daniel. <laughs> you think so? Your cameras aren't bad enough <laughs> or good enough. Ooh. <laughs> Now that's a, I want to dig into that. I'm curious to hear more about that. Anyway, long story short, I, uh, I weighed the X106 against the X-T5 and ultimately decided the X-T5 made more sense for the types of things that I generally need a camera for. So it's a little bit less portable, um, but sometimes we do paid things where we shoot uh, photos at events and being able to actually use that camera for that and put a good lens on it and so on seemed pretty valuable, uh, you know, as well as using it as like a B or a C camera for uh, video shoots and stuff. So all those all those reasons, X-T5 kind of made sense. It helped that I could actually find one in stock, uh, which, you know, is not the case for the X-106. And so I bought an X-T5 last week. Yeah, got a good deal, got it used. How many pictures have you shot with it, Daniel? Uh, probably 10. Something like that. Okay, so we've shot about the same amount of pictures with your X-T5. Yes, yes. <laughs> you just haven't had the chance to use it too much. Man, yet. you handed that to me and I instantly put my 56-1-2 on it and started snapping yeah, pictures. Yeah, did. Yep. <laughs> and those pictures came out pretty good. Okay, like, for like, I know that resolution isn't everything, but the detail of that 40 megapixel yep. sensor, like, I want an X-T5 so bad, and now, like... It's even worse. I mean, I'm very, I, I'm very confident that I'm going to sell my XT3 and buy an XT5 before that Euro trip, and we're just going to be our <laughs> XT5 bros going on this thing. But I mean, I, I was surprised actually at how much you can tell the detail. It is so good. Like it's so much better than the XT3. I mean, the XT3 is like really, really good. Mm-hmm. Hot dang! Yeah, and it uses that. Uh, NPW-235 yeah, battery. Yeah, it's got the bigger, newer battery. Mm-hmm. You're going to get a billion shots. Mm-hmm. Well, and I mean, I was happy because it, it's the same battery that I used in the X-H2S. Mm-hmm. So now I have three of those batteries and they're interchangeable between the cameras perfect. and that's ideal. Ugh. Uh, Ugh. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, it seems like the perfect choice. It's actually a great gimbal camera, just just like the X-T3 was mm-hmm. uh, because you can you know, interact with those dials pretty easily. It's fairly lightweight as far as cameras go. Mm-hmm. Uh, and all that seems great. It's a little compromised on the video side. I think we're going to dig into some of that footage soon. So we'll maybe get a little bit of a better idea, but, 
Uh, I mean, it's video specs are definitely not as good as some of the other options. Like if I was only buying it for video, I would have gotten something else. But I think for photos, it's going to be great. So, I mean, I like talking about cameras and we talk about a lot of different cameras. We haven't necessarily held or shot a good portion of the cameras that we talk about here. And like I have, like I own an X-T3 and I have shot that thing. Like I've shot so many pictures yeah, of that thing. Yeah, I need yeah. to pull up the, I don't know if it would give me shutter count with the amount of times I've accidentally reset that camera. <laughs> but if I could pull, I wish I could pull a shutter count and like see how many I've actually ran through. Cause I've, I've shot like probably well over 20,000 pictures with that camera. And I Sometimes, like, like, you get so used to what something, like, feels like when you hold it that I mean, I, I, I thought the XT5 was going to feel exactly the same. It is, it feels totally different. It was really funny when I, when you picked it up and you were like, oh, the grip's not as good. And they got rid of this button and then <laughs> he just immediately had all these thoughts. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, like, I, I hold, I hold this thing in my hand and the grip is deeper than the XT3. But, like, the way that they designed the XT3 grip, it's like, because the shutter button is on the top and not a forward shutter button, you're not necessarily going to hold the camera where your fingers are pointing back at you. Your fingers are going to be pointing down, like your your pinky ring and middle finger are going to be pointing down. And the, deep, the depth of the X-T5 grip begs you to do one or the, like, it, it's like, it doesn't work in my it, opinion. It wants you to hold it like a forward shutter back. Cut. Yeah, it's deep, like it wants to hold like a forward shutter camera, but you can't really you know, hit the button when holding it like that. And also it's not deep enough in my opinion, like for, for my hands at least to have my fingers pointing back towards the camera body. Yeah. And so I try to slide them down. Like I would hold the X-T3, which is very comfortable for me. And it's too deep to hold it in that fashion. And so it's like this weird in between. Yeah. And it was just, it was very obvious to me that I would have to like adjust how I was holding it and kind of like it would, it would essentially sit, it would have to sit differently in my palm compared to how I would hold Max C3, which is fine. Right. And like, I would definitely get used to it. I'm, I'm going to whenever I eventually get one. But it was, I don't know, it was like immediately apparent to me that, oh, this is just, a, it's just different. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny that, uh, I mean, I didn't pick up on those things because it's sufficiently different from the other Fuji cameras I have that I wasn't expecting it to feel a certain way. And I honestly haven't had the chance to use it yet enough to really get used to it. I'm trying to, rem I'm looking at my camera right now, trying to remember they, I thought that they removed a button for like a short period of time because on the X-T3, there is a function button between the ISO wheel and the mm -hmm. exposure wheel. And on the X-T5, they moved it yeah. to the other yeah, side it's on of the, the exposure wheel. It's on the outside of the camera. Mm -hmm. And so for a second there, I was like, hold on. They got rid of a button. <laughs> and I'm like looking for it. I'm like, oh, this is so dumb. The, the grip's dumb. And they got rid of a button. And what are they even doing? And then it was fine. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it, was, it was a very dramatic few moments for you, though. There was Daniel. I set this down really loudly real quick. <laughs> you don't even know. I just showed up. I'm like in I'm in I'm in work mode. Like we're we're gonna shoot a music video. I gotta get this cage together because I don't have a fancy doctor bag. And I'm like Yeah, I don't even know what you were doing. You had like an Allen wrench out, you were bolting things okay. together. I mean so it was out of control. Somebody somebody recommended to me a a plate for my cage setup. And they're like, this is a Swiss plate. It's really good. You just slide it in there and it's perfectly good. Mm -hmm. They failed to mention that whenever you take the camera out of that Swiss plate, that the little set screw that sets the the lever uh, loosens itself every time. And so in, like every third time that you put the camera back into that plate, you have to then tighten the screw. And it's not the same screw size as a normal, like however big Allen, it's smaller than that. So I have to carry a very specific different Allen wrench with me every time I have the cage set up because me, it's going to be loose. Let me introduce you to something called Loctite. <laughs> I don't know what that is, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> you got to explain not it to me. <laughs> Ugh, I do need to get Loctite though, yeah. like for real. <laughs> anyway so that's what i was doing and i'm just minding my own business and then all of a sudden someone's like i bought this fancy pants new camera all right isn't it super duper cool and i'm like oh my gosh it's so cool <laughs> but like it's not what i thought at first but like the pictures are really good but what about the grip oh it's a roller coaster yep yep i don't know what you're gonna do it sounds like you know what you're gonna do yeah and, I know and the I'm, answer yep. is buy an xt5 <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> and that's why i'm mad at you yep <laughs> well i'll get over it okay so speaking of Fuji, the X one hundred six. Yes, it came out recently. Yes, and we talked about it, and like we did our X one hundred six episode, and it was great. And since then, a lot of reviews have come out. Like 
all the like all the pre-orders are in and I thought maybe it would be worth to talk about it like a little more being that this is maybe the most popular camera in history. Yeah, I mean I think so just to you know at least see what are what are early people saying how's the how how's the release going? I think it's yep, reasonable. Yep. I mean it's like Canon AE1 uh Fujifilm X100. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, that may be a little bit of an exaggeration, but uh, this is our podcast, so we can say what we want. Yep. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the X100's above that. A <laughs> one. <laughs> That's impossible. Yes, it is. All right. So how how's all this going? Okay. Like, there have been a lot of claims about the pre-orders, uh, and some people are like, this is the most pre-ordered camera in history, and we're like, is that really, can you really figure, like, who can figure that out? I don't, they haven't actually released pre-order numbers, but- what we know is that Fujifilm essentially doubled the production capacity of the X100 5 to the X106 uh-huh. by moving to China. And I think that they're saying that they're going to make like 15000 a month or something. Yep. Well, and, and they said in their announcement that they were going to have plenty of stock at release. Lol. And what I heard, you know, a few days after release was like B&H was saying that people who ordered like six minutes into the like like six minutes after pre-orders open like those people weren't getting their cameras yet yeah so i mean it, it seems like the demand was much higher than fuji even thought it would be it's just all these people who have been wanting to get next 100 v like maybe this was their opportunity or people who were trying to scalp it because they know that it's really exciting like there's so much like demand and excitement around this camera and i'm i feel like we're so in like camera tech world as far as the loops of social media and youtube and blogs and all this stuff that like what i'm curious how other people are seeing and hearing about this thing yeah like are other people tracking like when is the next x100 coming out i don't know i mean you know like do they just happen to look at their camera store website and see that there's a new version of this camera i mean it feels to me like it has to mostly be people that kind of live in this world and you know, want these cameras, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I think that right now it's what, like six months or more before we're expecting, you know, people to actually be able to buy this thing. I would think so. Cause I think a while back Adorama was saying that they weren't expecting more stock until June or something or, yep. you know, so yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be months before you can just buy one of these things. If ever. Do you think we'll get to the point where you can just go out and buy an X106? I kind of do think we will. I mean, they they did move manufacturing to China. They're making a lot of them. I think between those things and other manufacturers possibly starting to release competing cameras, you know, that'll take a little bit of the market away. And I mean, I think eventually it's got to catch up. I think that the X106 is so interesting in that whenever, like, it's been out forever. I mean, the X100 original came out, what, like 2013, 2012, something like that? Mm-hmm. I mean, they've been around since the, the start of X-Mount, almost. Yeah, yeah, like 12 and, years or something. Yeah, yeah. So, like, it's it's been around, but it hasn't been popular in this way until, until you know, the whole, like, old, new again, vibe cam, right. whatever became popular. And... It feels like when they started making these things, it was more as like a here's an here's a travel cam, here's a second camera for yeah. you shooters, here's a really cool like Fuji camera for anyone who's in another system, but they still want a Fuji and they don't want to have to deal with owning a whole lens set. And it seemed like a lot of people were at one point buying them for that purpose. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's just this it's it's a niche other camera. And there was a whole market for these like you know, point and shoot, premium point and shoot, fixed lens cameras. I mean, it, it's barely a point and shoot because I, I feel like that has a lot of connotations sure. about image quality and stuff. And what's really interesting about the X100 series is that it is a interchangeable lens camera. Like all the internals, like the IBIS, the sensor, all that are the same as all of Fuji's lineup. And the only thing that's different is that it has that fixed lens. Right. And I feel like that makes it fundamentally different than most of these other uh, point and shoot cameras. Well, even still, I mean, Sony had their RX1 series, which I guess was really more built on top of the RX like 100 type mm-hmm. camera and not really, it's not like an A6600 backwards. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just think that's a, I think that's a difference. And maybe something like the RX1 or RX100, I mean, the RX100 is a one inch sensor, so not that, but like maybe the RX1, 
you know, legitimately is as good as something like an A6600, but I think that it gives you more, like, I think it garners more respect that the X100 series is, you know, like at its core is one of their like X mount, you know, premium cameras. I just, I find it super interesting how the, like the demand in the market has completely changed around these compact cameras because like talking about, you know, we, uh, you know, who was this originally for and that market? I mean, you had like the Pen F series from Olympus, you have, Nikon, who was gonna doing all this research to come out with their DL series and then canned it. Mm-hmm. The R one X isn't around anymore. Like there just aren't all these cameras used to exist around 2016, 2015, and then all the companies stopped making them except for Fuji and Leica. Yeah, and I mean Panasonic had their ver- like I guess yeah Panasonic had their version that like little micro four third I forget what it was called we talked about it a few a little while ago it was like the D something mm-hmm. and they stopped making those right and. Now, like the market for this kind of camera is no longer, you know, here's your secondary camera. It's people's first slash only camera, except for their phone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I just, I don't know, what do you, what do you think about that? What do you think about how, like, who are these cameras for now compared to who they were for like five years ago? I mean, I think you're right. I am seeing some of that. Now, I think in the world that we live in, I mean, in terms of like camera people, I am still seeing a lot of, you know, camera YouTubers and so on who, you know, it does feel like it is their second camera. And so I think there are still people buying it for that purpose. But I mean, it kind of comes back, I think, to what we were talking about in the pre-show about the vibe cam and people wanting a camera for the memories or, you know, just something to something that feels um, unique or different than shooting on their phone. And I think that people don't feel like they need to have a camera that can do everything because they're used to shooting on their phone anyway. And so they'll just use their phone for stuff and then they have this special other little camera. And I guess I guess to me it just feels like the the needs that people have for cameras have fundamentally changed since uh smartphones really started getting, you know, good cameras. What was the name of that vintage camera app? Um well, there's like Hipstomatic. That's the one I'm thinking okay. of. Like, why are people not just using Hipstomatic instead of like going out and spending $1,500 on these cameras? And do you think the answer is that they've seen their favorite influencer using an X100 camera? I mean, that could be a huge part of it. Do you think that cameras like the X106 now are, are they for more for like camera people or not camera people? That's a hard question to answer, but I mean, I guess I would say they're probably for non camera people, but I don't know. I think, I mean, I, they want it to be both, right? Fuji would like for both both groups to buy it. Do you think that this it's a stepping stone for a lot of people? I feel like most people will buy an X106 and maybe they, they won't shoot with it as much as they want to or think that they were going to. And I think that it will be their only camera. Yeah. Which I think is going to be a really good camera for a lot of people. I think, and I think it's a better camera for some people than buying like a Rebel. That if you were going to go out and like, oh, I just want to buy it, like a, I guess it's, that's a totally different comparison because a Rebel you could get for like 600 bucks and this is like a $1,400 camera. Okay. So never mind. I take that back. But it just, it, it's, but it's interesting though. It's like, it's, it's not an entry level camera, and, but it is a, it's a very specialized camera. I, I think that's worth pointing out. It's not a, you said $1,400. It's $1,600. Sorry, 1600 And that. I mean, even even with inflation, even with everything being more expensive, sixteen hundred dollars is a lot of money to pay for a camera. Right, it's camera plus lens, but even still, that is like straight in the mid range, mm-hmm. if not high mid range. I mean, for that much money, like yeah, you, a sixty seven hundred with a two hundred dollar lens, maybe not so much that, but you know, an eight hundred to a thousand dollar camera plus lens. Mm-hmm. I mean, just just that money outlay, you didn't spend that much on a camera until you got the XH two S. Yeah. That's basically true. Well, no, I bought my X-T3 for, I think it was 1700 Okay. Okay. So right about the same. But I mean, it just feels like... But even still, that was my second camera, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it was me, like, after I had got into photography enough to say, I want something that's better and nicer. Yeah. And that's where I landed, was like, that was the, my, my mid-budget, having been shooting for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe, more than that. maybe I'm wrong in thinking that it's for non-camera people, because it, it just feels like a pretty hard sell to me. Maybe. I mean, I guess it depends upon how much you want those vibes. But also, I mean, all these vibe cams, I mean, you're going to buy that camcorder for 200 bucks out the door. If that. If that. $70. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's, 
I still think it's really, really cool, and I really, really want one, but we'll probably never buy one because I already have all the lenses, and so I'm yeah. just going to buy an X-T5 if I want to get yeah, that sensor. I mean, I like I said, I did consider it whenever I was buying the X-T5, and you know, for the travel use case, I think it would have been a better choice just because it would have been smaller, but... I mean, ultimately, it was just hard for me to justify with all the other photography stuff I do just because, it, you know, I mean, it's less it's less useful than, mm-hmm. than an interchangeable camera. I have been having trouble finding good reviews that talk about the quality of the lens on the X106. Interesting. I think that the X106 basically has the same 23 millimeter f2 lens that's on the X100V. I think that's right. But it's on a different sensor, so I mean, it's right. gonna, you know, it's hard to know. It's going to resolve differently. It's going to be different, mm-hmm. and I haven't been able to find good like test chart photos and things that are going to check like chromatic aberration and that sort of thing. Yeah, to see like how it compares. I was looking at some comparisons and like discussion on like a bunch of Fuji lenses on like just different like blogs and uh, Substack and and Medium and just kind of all over the place. And where the consensus seemed to land was was that. The uh, lens that's on the X100 5 or X100V is basically on par in line with the old series of 1.4 lenses. That if you're going to, you can compare it to maybe a 16 or a 16 millimeter 1.4, it's probably better than the 23 1.4. Yeah. But not better than the 23 1.4 WR. Mm-hmm. Those newer Fuji lenses, the 18, the 23, and the 33, which are essentially replacing the, the 16, the, 20, the 35, and the, and the 23. Those linear motor WR lenses are way better than their the ones from the preceding lenses, hmm. especially yeah. the twenty three. That the old twenty three is so much worse, but it has more character, Dan. Uh-huh. And, and I love it so much. That's what you, because... you have the old one. Yes, I do. Yeah. Can we talk about that lens for a little no, bit? It's no. got a clutch. We don't have time for that. Oh my gosh! It, it I do think that the lens in the and I've heard that the lens in the X one hundred is better. Because it doesn't have to be interchangeable. I think they can get it closer to the sensor. And there, there's something in there where it's like, yeah, it, you know, it's it just just because a lens has the same maximum aperture and, uh, you know, focal length, like they're not all created equal. You know, like a 23 F2 is not the same as every other 23 F2. It's the, it's the Nikon advantage that flange distance yeah. is so short that you can say, oh, well, let's, we get all this better resolution and resolving power and whatever. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, like you don't have to deal with the lens mount, so it can be as close. You can design it perfectly, this lens for this sensor. Yeah. And, I mean, that's essentially what they did. But I think that, you know, if you're, like, cross-shopping and comparing and, like, how good is X106, I think that maybe the new 23WR on next T5 or the, uh, the 33 1.4 are going to be better probably in every way compared to an x106 interesting but smaller less pocketable sure wait bigger less pocketable right right yeah. anyway so I, I, interesting uh other things that maybe stood out that were worth talking about rolling shutter and video i think uh gerald and Dunn posted his x106 yeah, bit, uh, that. review which was hilarious yeah yeah very good video you need to watch that if you haven't seen it so funny uh, but basically, like it's it's essentially what we're seeing on the XC5, maybe a little worse. Like your oversampled 4K and your 6K are cropped. The rolling shutter is like 25. It's but you can d- get 422 10-bit. Like it's good image quality. Yep. What I didn't realize is that it has the old XT30 design still, which means that it has a 2.5 millimeter headphone jack, and it doesn't have a mic or a mic jack. Interesting. And then the headphones are USB C. Oh, weird. Okay. Yeah, which was an, an, like, they think they fixed that with the XT30 Mark II, mm. but it was an annoying feature for a short period of time with the XT30 series cameras where your mic your mic jack was a 2.5 and you had to carry an adapter and yep. your headphones were USB-C. Now, I do think that the XT5 has the headphone USB-C thing. The XT5 doesn't have a... I, it, it, there's no way that it doesn't have a headphone jack and a mic port. I, I mean, it has a mic port, but I don't think it has a, a headphone port. Stop it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I don't believe you. Yeah. Oh, nope. We're going to check that later. All right. We're going to look back on that. But uh, I think that was most of the things that kind of stood out when I was watching back some of the reviews and like checking, you know, how, how good is this thing compared to the predecessor and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much what I saw too. And um, I mean, it's a, a, like the video story on this is a lot the same as the X-T5 uh, with regards to crop modes and video and rolling shutter performance. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because the same sensor is on the X-H2. And that camera has better video specs in a lot of ways. It can yeah. do 8K video. Um, I think it can do 
4K 60 without a crop and without like that, that, I can't remember all the details, but the XH2 is more capable. Yeah, it but comes down to a, heat dissipation. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a physically larger camera, and so it can dissipate the heat better. Yeah, for sure. So last little bit on the X100 stuff. Do you think like with the way that this market turns turned and the amount of pre-orders on this camera, are we going to see other camera companies like turn around and start bringing back this series of camera? Are we going to see another RX1 on R? Are we going to see Sony revive, or not Sony, Nikon revive the DL series? Or are we going to see OM systems come out with a new Pan F? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think that Fuji's kind of left the door open a little bit because even though they've tried to increase production, they clearly haven't increased production enough and you can't buy one of these cameras. And I mean, so, you know, I'm looking at the market and I see there's this X106 that you can't buy. If you try to buy an X100V, a lot of times those seem pretty overpriced if you look online and it's like, okay, do I get that or do I get the $600 or $6,000 like a Q3? I mean, there's not a lot of great options there. So I think there is room for somebody else to kind of jump into this market. I am what you might call a crop sensor apologist and I am completely satisfied with these being APS-C cameras. They can be smaller. I like them a lot. So you don't agree with all these people that are like, why isn't it full frame? There are so like so many of the like the things that you review. Like, man, I really like Fuji doesn't have to have this be APS-C because blah, blah, blah. Why can't this be a full frame sensor? Full frame sensors are better, blah, blah, blah. They're just totally missing the point of what Fuji has done with this camera. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, I, I get the whole argument for full frame and like great. But I always, always just get like a little annoyed because <laughs> I'm like, I understand that it gives you like maybe one more stop of noise performance. But, you know, sometimes that trade off is not worth it if you're trying to get maybe speed or whatever. And we don't need we don't need to rehash APS-C versus full frame right now. Yeah. But I think that the point is it is ingrained enough in the photo- photography community and especially in the people who are like, yeah, I like I like taking pictures, but. I don't really want to get into all the details of like specifications and like uh, I was going to say a nerdy term that I forgot what you call the distance between the pixels. Yeah. Oh, geez. Anyways, like they don't want to get into the specs. They don't want to like talk about X trans or whatever. And what you're going to say is like, well, everyone says full frames better, like bigger is better. That makes sense. Full frames better. And so I think that the market for this camera just in like, assumes that full frame is better full stop yeah yeah without and, without thinking about it without uh without caring honestly it's just i mean like it's just a, a fact that they accept as truth right and the only full frame camera in this market is the leica q3 and the leica yeah. q2 and if sony or canon or nikon came rolling in or even like maybe like panasonic with a dl that would be super super sick they come rolling in and they go here is a three thousand dollar version $2,500 version and it's full frame. It's better because it's full frame. I think I think it would sell. It would sell like crazy. It would eat straight into Fuji's market. Mm-hmm. And like I think that the retro design and the film simulations are probably 95% of why people buy the X106. Uh, but I just, I find it so interesting the idea that someone could sell a 24 or 30 megapixel full frame version of this kind of camera. It would probably outsell the X106, even though it's higher resolution and probably kind of cooler as far as the JPEGs that you get. Mm -hmm. I think you're probably right. I don't know. I'm just wildly assuming. And like, I mean, come on. Sony can, like, they have to swoop in and take this market. Like, why wouldn't they? I mean, they've got the uh, A7CR. You basically get that camera and put, you know, integrate a lens. Yeah. Oh, man, that would be so cool. Ooh, ooh, that would be so cuz cool. the camera's already small. Mm-hmm. It's full frame. It's got a high megapixel sensor. I would love to see an A7CR. I mean I would I would want to buy that camera. I would buy that camera so hard. <laughs> that or a Nikon ZF. That's fixed lens. Yeah. Either way, either one of those would work. Yeah, both of those would be incredible. Yep. And they're right there. I mean they're right there. They are. Anyway, okay. By the way, one one quick note on the X106. Mhm. Something that'll make you want it more. You mentioned a few weeks ago, you're like, why doesn't anyone else do this thing that Leica does where you can crop in and get different focal lengths? 
mm-hmm. you can do that on the X100 Six with pictures. Yes, so oh, they have uh, sweet. So you know, it's a forty megapixel sensor. Yes, you can also get thirty, twenty, and ten megapixel modes that crop in on the sensor and give you different focal lengths. Dang it, Daniel! <laughs> oh, I want it so bad. Yeah, I just so bad. That's so cool. I'm that's still gonna the, that, buy an XT Five instead, but. St- it's so cool. That's the advantage to using a higher megapixel sensor, though, is you can do that and still yeah. get a reasonable photo. Mm-hmm. I mean, even like a 30 megapixel at like a 1.3 crop. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I'm, in, I'm into it. That's super <laughs> cool. Okay. We got to stop talking about that camera. We, we've we we've spent the past few weeks, we've spent too much time on that. Camera. No, we, have, we, told, we only talked about it once, Daniel. We got to talk about it more. People want to hear about the X106. Uh, you're not wrong. And oh my gosh, Daniel, I'm lo- that was supposed to be a 10 minute segment. <laughs> Not so much. Okay, so We're I'm going long today. I'm just going to go ahead and move everything about the music video shoot to next week. Good plan. We're not going to talk about that. And we're going to spend way not enough time on the next bit. Sounds good. So, uh, you know, that kind of feels fitting, though, honestly. Oh, geez. To, it does. To just like the, the left behind forgotten uh, segment. Yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. All right, what do we got? So I want to I want to start a series, not a segment. So this isn't a segment of the podcast, but I want to do a series on camera manufacturers. And I want to take like a main topic for the next whatever seven episodes or so and focus on just specifically like a candy manuf- camera manufacturers and maybe talk about like, okay, here's where they are in their lineup and like their release cycle, and like here's mm-hmm. what maybe is coming up for them next and like what do we think they should be doing and what are they not doing? And maybe some of the controversies around them. Like when we talk about Canon, we'll talk about like, should they open it up for third party, Mm -hmm. for example, and how they want to be like the best, like by 20, was it 2020, 30, they want to be the, the, um, by a wide margin, the most selling. Yeah. We got, we got to dig into that for sure. Oh yeah. So, but like, uh, I put Canon on for next week. We're not even talking about Canon this week, Daniel. This is the first in our series. And I picked OM digital systems because I have had the OM1 Mark II on our list to talk about since it released like a month and a half yeah. ago. Yeah, we do need to talk about that. And, and, and this is also the first and only time that OM will ever be top of anyone's mind. Oh, geez. May, well, maybe not. I mean, there's rumor that they're going to come out with the OM1X. <laughs> I could, mean, it might have two processors in it, Daniel. I mean, I got to say, like, like you know, I know we're, we're about to get into it, but I, I feel like I, I need to be given a reason to care what OM System is doing. Okay, Daniel. OM system is in it now, right? They broke they broke off. They broke off the imaging system and the microscope system from Olympus, which I didn't even know. I was like, what is Olympus doing now that they're not doing cameras? And it's like medical stuff, right? Mm-hmm. They don't make, you know, imaging systems and medical whatevers and this, that, and the, Yes, medical whatevers. Mm-hmm, ultrasound, something, something. Okay. That that business is a low rucative. I bet. Anyway. So they they're like, they're, we're not making enough money on this, and let's let's break it out. So they sold, Olympus sold their camera stuff to JIP, which is probably not how you say that. <laughs> <laughs> you think they got a good deal? <laughs> I tried to find out how much the Japanese industrial partners bought Olympus for. Couldn't find it. Yep. But shortly after they bought Olympus, not shortly because that was two years ago, they purchased Toshiba. Fun fact. Toshiba made the first digital camera that I ever used. Yeah. They used to make digital cameras. They still make imaging sensors. They make CMOS and CCD sensors for like lab applications and this sort of thing. Yeah, or like industrial like, like conveyor belts and yeah, that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sort of stuff. But they have a sensor manufacturing whatever. Okay. And like I'm sure that's not the only reason the JIP, not what they're called, bought Toshiba. But... OM, OM Digital Systems, which is now its own thing, they are only a camera company. And they, they're they not like Olympus, who has like multiple different things on their mind. OM Digital Systems is about if we're going to survive as a, as a sector of a company, like our cameras have to survive. And well, I think that, that that could be good. That reason alone makes OM interesting. Yeah. I mean, it, you would think they would be very focused then. But I well, mean, what do we have to, yeah. <laughs> what do we have to show for it though? Well, they've released. I think they've released two cameras under the OM name. And whenever they broke from Olympus, they said, okay, you can use the Olympus name for two years, but you got to transition to OM. And so they are, we're officially out of that. So OM, OM Digital Systems is not going to be releasing anything else under the Olympus name. Even if you go out and you start looking to buy an Olympus lens, the 
their their branding has always been the what is it M Zucchio Zuc- yeah M Zucchino yeah Zucchino you got it that's exactly what they're called yeah they dropped the Olympus off the name now it's just M dot okay interesting Z yeah. I've never like I've owned those lenses I've never been able to say it yep point is it's all gone man so like we have the OM five which came out in twenty twenty two and we have the OM one Mark two which we have to talk about. And those are their two cameras right now. And they still, you can still like maybe buy the Olympus ones. But right now, it, they just have two cameras. And it's like, what's going to happen next? Yeah. And I mean, so I can't remember. Isn't isn't one of their existing cameras kind of just like a rebadged older camera? Is there something yeah, like that? Yeah. Okay. So the OM5 is a s- very similar to what was the Olympus OMDE M5 Mark II, three Mark III, which, which, I think the best thing that come out of JIP buying the Olympus imaging sector is the name of these cameras. Yeah, they got to simplify this stuff, man. I mean, the OMDE M5 Mark III what are you doing? It, it sounds like a Samsung refrigerator. Sony has better camera names than that. <laughs> like, if you can't beat Sony, what are you doing? Yeah, pretty bad. It's, but now, OM1, OM5. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Easy. Yep. It's like having a D1 and a D5 and mm-hmm. you know, whatever. But like the OM5 came out in 2022, and it was basically the DE5 Mark III, which had the same sensor as the E. M1 Mark II, which is what the e, the OM1, I think, was very similar. It's like it was a, the OM1 was a, a basically an O, an OM EM1 Mark III, I think. And then the previous version before that was the OM EM1 Mark II. So people are seeing why these names are confusing. It's so hard. Uh, but the, the EM1 Mark II came out in like 2016. Okay. And then I think that the uh, M5 Mark III came out in like 2019 and it had basically the same sensor. With, like, they took the top of the line sensor from three years ago, put it in the mid-range camera. So now- Makes we, total sense. So now we've got this OM5 Which, and it's using a sensor from 2016? Basically the same sensor that was in the previous version. So yeah, it's using a sensor from like 2016. And so this is like my big question about OM1 right now is the OM1 Mark II, the brand new one, has this super sick Micro Four Thirds stack sensor. It's incredible with like the like the way that they do the phase detect and the speed and like it is a really 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 good 20 megapixel sensor. Like it is up there with you know the A1 and all of these other stack sensors. Everything else is like super super old. <laughs> Like everything else they have are using sensors from almost mm-hmm. a decade ago, like eight years ago. And I'm wondering, like, what is what is OM Systems plan? Are yeah. they going to leverage their purchase of Toshiba and start making their own sensors and come rolling out here with like their super baller micro four third sensors? Are they going to keep buying them from Sony? I don't know. Are they going to take this current sensor and, you know, is that going to roll down to the OM5 Mark II? And then they, you know, use a use a new one in their top of the line camera. I mean, I, I mean that I that that can make sense as well. Yeah. So, OM is OM is doing their thing. I think that they feel a lot of pressure to emulate the lineup from Olympus, and that lineup was primarily the one, the five, and the ten. And, and so, I assume I assume those are in order of capability. Right. It's like professional, high end, and mid range, or mm-hmm. something like that. And so we're, I'm thinking that this year we're probably going to see an OM-10. Yeah, because that's what's missing now. Mm-hmm, that's what's missing. I don't know what they're going to put in it. Like, are they going to put the same sensor that's in the OM-5? Or are they going to do something different? Yeah. Because I feel like it, it desperately needs to be maybe a newer sensor with yeah, newer technology. Yeah, you know, they need to not keep using the same thing from 2016. Mm-hmm, for sure. But then, then it's going to make the 5 look bad if the 10 is the same sensor in it. Right. They'd have to come up with something else to differentiate those. Mm-hmm. So it just, it seems very interesting where OM is right now and their, like their whole market. Like what, what's the, like these are micro four third cameras. It feels like Panasonic has already started investing in full frame. Mm-hmm. They still have their, their Lumix G9 line and that sort of thing. And like they still sell those, but it doesn't feel like their primary focus. And so OM is kind of left out here. They're 
on their own now. They're no longer under Papa Olympus up on Mount Zion. And they're just, you know, like we have to survive now. We are the micro four third camera manufacturer. What makes us different? What makes us better? Yep. Yeah. And I mean, it kind of gives them some space to play in, but they've, st- like you said, they have to come up with something to differentiate because, I mean, somebody like me looks at that and says, well, why would I buy one of these cameras when I can get, you know, a Fuji camera or a Sony camera that has a bigger sensor and, you know, equally or more modern features? You know, what is what is OM giving me that I'm not getting from those? So I think that there are three things that they're positioning themselves as to create that appeal. And the first is something that OM has been doing or Olympus has been doing since the dawn of Olympus back in like the fifties or the seventies. And that's saying like, here is a, here's a very compact camera that you can take with you anywhere. And it's not going to weigh you down. Mm. There were some very small Olympus film cameras that they made for years. Some really cool ones. Like the, was it the M 35 or something? I kind of want to buy one of those. Cause it's like super, super small and super adorable. But the OM cameras are, they're small and they have small lenses sure. and you're, you're built out. Micro Four Third OM kit is probably going to weigh at at half or less than an equivalent full frame kit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even just a full frame twenty four to seventy is a, a huge and bulky lens, and yeah, you can get very capable lenses for Micro Four Thirds for less money. Mm-hmm. And they're leaning into that, saying, you know, this this is so portable and so travelable. We are also now the only I, IP certified IP certified camera that you can buy it's interesting like, it's like ip53 or something for the om1 mark ii most other cameras are just like weather resistant or splash whatever this one is actually rated and so the five is like ver- water falling vertically up to a 60 degree angle offset that's being sprayed onto the camera will not create an ingress oh that's pretty good and then the next rating is for dust mm-hmm. it's not dust proof it's not like a four which would be dust proof it's a three and so it prevents a certain level of dust ingress, but it's not like fully dust proof. Yeah. But if you were going to take this into some extreme environment, it might be a better choice than a lot of other cameras. Yeah. This will hold up better than all of its competitors. And like you would hope it would because like the, the OM1 Mark II is like $2,400 yeah. or something. Yeah. Like it is a premium, premium camera. And like the OM5, still good, not, not rated that I'm aware of. But they're like, you can take them anywhere. And like, this is why you buy Olympus. They're light, they're small, and they're rugged, hmm. okay. which is cool. Yeah. And also probably why they still are releasing cameras under the tough line. Yeah, because that's a totally separate line they have, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. It's like a little point and shoot camera, like an actual point and shoot camera that you can like take underwater. Mm-hmm. I think we talked about those a few weeks ago. Yeah, we did. It's yeah. kind of cool. Yeah, I can see that being the right camera for some people. And then I think that the other thing that they're pushing is computational photography. Oh, really? How, like... We've talked about that, but how does that factor in? A good number of the features, and we need to talk about the OM-1 in detail, but Mm -hmm. a good number of the flagship features for this camera are basically computational photography features. Things like the composite shot and the high-resolution stills and the live ND. These are all a function of multiple exposures composited together yeah. into a raw and JPEG file. And that's something that we've kind of wondered why camera manufacturers haven't done because we're seeing phones do all these sophisticated things and they do it because they have to to make up for the optics. But it's like, right. well, if that technology exists, then if you have something that has a bigger sensor, then how much better could it be? And so right. it's cool that they're doing that. Yeah, and so like that's what they're doing. You could shoot an HDR with this thing. And I mean, the way it reads out so fast. So one of the improvements of the OM-1 versus the OM-1, Mark 1 versus Mark 2, was they they like, they like massively increased the RAM. Mm-hmm. And so the buffer on this camera is crazy. But it can shoot, it can shoot 120 frames per second photo. Yes, that's impressive. Which is like it and the A3, A9 A9 Mark III. Like, I think those are the only ones that are hitting those numbers. Yeah. I mean, that's a that's a very high number. Yeah. So it, so it can hit. I mean, that doesn't have autofocus. If you want autofocus, it's going to be 50. But you're shooting 100 to 50 frames per second in photo and like full res raw. Mm-hmm. Like It can take those and like stack them and do the HDR thing. And so you can shoot you can shoot HDR in this camera. And that's it's, it's cool. kind of cool. And I think that I think we're going to see more and more of that from Olympus is more of these interesting computational features. The high-end camera that came out previously 
So like, I don't remember what it was called, but it's the one that is above the, the Olympus D E M one, whatever they're like super top tier is, which for OM is rumored to be the OM one X. Whenever they came out with that, it was a lot of these computational features that we're seeing in the OM one, but they were able to do it because they did things like dual processors and all this fancy stuff. Ah, okay. So there's like rumor that the OM one X could have two processors in it. Interesting. So they can like do yeah. even more of this computational stuff even faster. Well, it's good to see that they're trying to differentiate, you know, that there's something unique about them compared to all these other brands. Cause otherwise I wouldn't think they would stand a chance. Yeah. It's like, we keep asking why micro four thirds, why micro four thirds. And I think that, you know, Olympus has zeroed in on exactly why, yeah. which is size and weight, good IBIS and, Let's do things that other cameras can't because yeah. of readout speed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the, yeah, it's, it's go to the strengths of it. Mm-hmm, exactly. And I think that like when we were talking about what is OM going to do as a camera company, where are they going, and like what is next for Micro Four Thirds, I think that what we're going to see is like OM is now in this world where they have a very mature lens ecosystem. And they can, they don't have to really focus too hard on coming out with newer and newer lenses. Agreed. They can then, they can focus on what can we make with the advantages that we have that is something that full frame and APS-C cameras literally can't do. Right. I yeah. think I think it's really interesting. I think it makes sense. I mean, Micro Four Thirds does have a lot of really cool lenses available for it. And like you said, it's a mature ecosystem. I mean, as long as Panasonic is still making those, uh, those Leica lenses, I don't know why you would need much else. So yeah, that, yeah. that the ten twenty five one point seven and the twenty five to fifty one point seven are incredible lenses. Even the even the Panasonic branded ones. I mean, I have the Panasonic forty two point five. You know, which is basically an eighty five equivalent. That's a very good lens. Yeah, it's a it's an excellent lens, and they're affordable and small. And I mean, it's hard to go wrong. Yeah, for sure. I do wonder if. And maybe like, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think that global sensors coming into the market on the top end for full frame will cannibalize the speed advantage for micro four thirds? Or do you think that because you like pixel density is a problem on micro four thirds, even their top end on one Mark two is like 20 megapixels. Yeah. So like there's that part of the data pipe, the image processing pipeline to consider well, I think and answer a, this question. Well, that's a pretty big part of the problem, right? Because I mean, you know, if it's 20 megapixels versus 40 or 60 or whatever, that's mm-hmm. a lot less data to be processing. And so, you know, if, if you consider that computing power is kind of like a, like you can only get whatever's available, right? And so you, you should be able to do more on the micro four third side. But the problem is, you know, people are going to start demanding higher and higher megapixel counts. I mean, as screens get better, you know, standards go up, like people want more and you know, 20 is going to start feeling kind of archaic. I I agree. I think 20 is pretty low and I I don't want to see Olympus come out with another camera that's below 20. I felt limited by my 16 megapixels even six years ago, seven years ago. Mm-hmm. And I think that if they come out with like an OM 10 and it's 16 megapixels, I think it's going to be a problem. But what do you think about, do you think that full frame global sensors will like basically ruin what OM is trying to take as their advantage here? Cause you like, you no longer have the speed advantage. Well, I think they could, but I think OM has some time before that happens because I think that we are still a ways away from seeing global sensors be commonplace. And I mean, that gives them a lot of time to establish themselves to, you know, lean into some of those other advantages of the small size, uh, you know, durability, all that stuff. And I mean, if they can maintain an advantage on the computational side, then, you know, they'll at least be competitive against the full frame stuff. So I don't know. I mean, I I guess it's an open question, but um, I think they have a chance. I guess guess we'll see. And like, but for all of that reason... I'm actually excited to see like what is OM going to do this year. Yeah, well, I mean, it may at least give us... Uh, Micro Four Thirds has always been kind of a preview of what to expect from larger sensors because mm-hmm. it kind of leads in that area. And so seeing what they do might be interesting because that might show us what's going to be available on some of the larger sensor cameras in, you know, two years, three years, something mm-hmm. like that. For me, one of the things that I would be most excited... Like, I want to see what they do for the computational stuff. I want to see an OM-1X... Olympus OM has basically been a forgotten camera brand for me. I really don't think about yeah. it very much. I can't see myself buying one. But what I like, if they came out with a new 
Pen F2. Like they came out with the Pen F. If they came out with a new version of the Pen, that would be interesting to me. I would still prefer uh, an X106 to it because I'm a Fuji fanboy a little bit. But there is rumor that they could release a new Pen camera, which if you don't know, a Pen, the Pen F came out in 2016. They have come out with a different version of that, which was for the Japan market, which was like a Pen E7 and then a Pen E10 and something like that. I don't necessarily know what those were. I think they're like a lower end version of the Pen F. The Pen F is the highest end version of these really small rangefinder style cameras. Think of like the GX7, GX85 series from Panasonic. Mm -hmm. Very similar size, extremely small. They're about as small as a GR3, which is just super duper small. Yeah, okay. But they're still interchangeable lens. Mm. And the micro four thirds, but if you get like the twenty five millimeter pancake and you sure. put it on a pen F, that thing's like it's so small. It's and you know, like it's amazing photo like image quality because it's the highest in micro four third camera, but it's in a very 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 small package. Yeah, and so I think that the pen F, which looks retro, it looks like those old school Olympus cameras with the dials, which looks so so good. I think if they came out with a pen F Mark II, it would immediately compete. With the X106. Yeah, I think you're probably right. And that, that you know, we were just talking earlier about it. And I think that'd be interesting. And I think they would stand a chance at that camera selling well. Mm-hmm. The Pen F was, was like a cult camera. Yeah. People are still super into that camera. It's really, really awesome. And I would, I don't know, I would, I want to see that from OM more than anything yeah, else. Yeah, maybe even more than the, the OM10. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, the, or the OM1X, which sounds absolutely nuts. Like yeah. you came out with a, like a, a vertical grip micro four third camera that's like <laughs> super nuts and has dual processors and is doing like a bunch of computational photography. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I'd be really into seeing what that is too. That'd be pretty cool. Man, Daniel, we're like, we're like way over. Yeah. And, and we, we, had, we haven't even talked about the we camera. We haven't even gotten to the other one work too. Oh, there's so many things I have to tell you about it, but I've got to make it happen though, no, right? We just have to push it. Like, yeah. do you want to, do you want to get into it or do you want to push it? Ah, oh, man, I don't know. I mean, I mean how, how would I, it be weird to do the rest of the OM next time and then <laughs> and then talk about Canon? I feel like it'd be a little weird. Okay, fine. We're going to get into it. Let's uh let's just try to focus on the highlights here. Okay. So, the big things that are important, it's like it it's average across the board as far as like EVF back screen resolution at like 5.6. Mm-hmm. It's essentially the same as an OM1 Mark 1 as far as like it's rugged and all this stuff. There was a really cool grip that they came out with for the OM something, the Olympus version that was like a rubberized grip. And the OM1 had like a plastic ear grip. They brought the new cooler better Olympus grip to this camera. Okay. That's good. And from what I understand, it's one of the nicest camera grips that you can get, like up there with a the Canon. Hmm. Really, really good. They added RAM, which I already talked about. Everything else is basically up the middle. So like really good IBIS. It's got phase detect autofocus. It's got the IP rating. You can shoot 120 frames per second. All this sort of thing. Some of the things that are an improvement, one is the autofocus. So the continuous tracking autofocus for the OM1 was like, okay, Olympus base, not Olympus, OM1 essentially said, maybe don't use it. It's not very good. <laughs> Awkward. It was like the continuous with the tracking. It just wasn't good. I think that this new version that's in the OM1 Mark II is a lot better. Like it's noticeably significantly better. So we have a lot better autofocus. It's basically the same speed as far as, you know, how fast it's shooting. It's almost, I think it is the exact same sensor. So it's the same stacked 20 point whatever megapixel sensor. And you just talked about that and said that that is a really good sensor that's basically competitive against, you know, the newest stuff we're seeing. Yeah, for sure. I think that the high, the biggest standout features are, like I said, the computational stuff. So this being micro four thirds is going to shoot 14 bit, sorry, it's going to shoot 12 bit RAWs. And I think that if I was in the compact camera market in a world where like a pen f existed alongside of an x106 mm-hmm. the one of the biggest sells for me of the x100 and the aps-c sensor is 14-bit readout yeah yeah it does make a difference yeah it it legit makes a difference 12-bit raw versus 14-bit raw like you can really tell yeah 14 to 16 maybe less but the like the detail in the shadows the dynamic range the color fidelity it's just that much better in 14-bit RAW. That's yeah. why Nikon for years was like, eat it, Canon, 14-bit RAW. And now Canon's 14-bit RAW. Yeah. Funny how that happens. Funny how that happens. So, like, you you're, don't have as good RAW files unless you use this super cool high-res mode. And so on a tripod or 
handheld, which is nuts. Yeah. I guess they're using the IBIS to make it mm-hmm. steady. Exactly. Uh, and But also, like, the, the image size and the sensor size are different. Like, it's a four third, it's a four by three sensor, but it's a like a 23 megapixel sensor, but you get 20 point something oh, weird. images. Interesting. So, like, they're probably doing something along those lines for that. Anyways, you can get 80, pe- 80 megapixel 14 bit raw files. Oh, wow. Which are substantially better than the out of camera raw files. That's that pretty cool. Bit. That's pretty cool that they were able to not just make it high resolution, but also increase the bit depth. Mm-hmm. Like, legit. The just the res the resolution, the color detail, the fidelity of those photos is like for real way, way, way better than like to just the straight out of camera with 12 bits. Huh. Pretty cool. So, anyways, you get that if you're shooting, if you're traveling to the top of Mount Everest and you want to bring the most rugged camera and you still want to get the sickest picture, well, now you can because you can shoot the 80 pick mix. Yeah. I can see the value. Yeah. That's super neat. cool. It has live ND, which I saw that and I was trying to figure out what it meant. Like, did they put an ND filter in this camera? No, they did not. They are doing, they are taking a bunch of really fast pictures and they're compositing them to uh, create motion blur. So it's not so that you can shoot darker. It's so that you can shoot your waterfalls and get all the motion. Oh, weird. And so it's shooting a bunch of images just like your phone would and then stacking them in a way to create the motion blur so that you can get the things that aren't moving sharp by using that short shutter speed and then using the other shots that have the motion to create the motion. And it is really good. Like it's, it looks like you shot it with an ND and you can get some really cool looking images. I just, I mean, I don't know how I feel about that. It, it's, it's not making up for shortcomings of the camera, I think is what feels weird to me about that. So whereas the high resolution thing, it's like, okay, this is a low megapixel sensor that can only read out 12 bits. So we're going to do this thing to make it better. Mm-hmm. The ND thing just feels like it's not going to be as good as using a real ND, but, but I it, guess you don't have to carry it with you. It kind of is, though. Like, whenever you compare the two, it's fairly comparable hmm. as far as not having to carry all this with you, but still being able to get your handheld, like, water motion shots hmm. without using uh, an actual ND filter. And, like, handheld's the key thing there. I mean, if you want to get it for real, like you're bringing an ND and you're bringing a tripod. Yeah, that's, for this, that's true. You're, I mean, you're just leaning over and taking the shot and you're getting it. Okay. Yeah, so it does give you a unique capability then that you wouldn't have with a physical ND. Mm-hmm. That's kind of cool. And then along the same lines, they have this thing called Live Composite, which is does a similar thing, but it's also kind of nuts. So uh, we've taken like light trail shots before yeah, yeah. where you like you do – a long exposure mm-hmm. and you kind of get this thing moving, but that thing still, maybe you like use flashes to create those images and that sort of thing. Right. They have this thing called live composite, which is essentially for that, but it protects the highlights. And so you can do this like long exposure for light trails. But then if you have your main subject that's supposed to be still is lit, it's not going to blow it out because it's going to like understand where your exposure is supposed to be. And then composite a bunch of images so that you get the blurry things for the motion, but then the still things for the still thing. You can create these really interesting like composite shots where you didn't have to do it in Lightroom after the fact or Photoshop. You do it in camera, and it, like it just basically works. Well, I think it's cool they're doing all that stuff. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I kind of it's with things like that. I mean, I guess I'm kind of skeptical until I see it work, but it sounds pretty good. And I mean, it's cool to have those options. Yeah, it is cool. And then the last thing is HDR, which like the X-H2S does it. Other cameras do it where you can shoot. Actually, I don't know how many other cameras do it, but I know that our camera does it, this camera does it, and it's probably a stack sensor thing. I should probably go dig yeah. into other cameras and see. But essentially, like you can select a bracket mode and choose like the number of frames and then shoot HDR in camera. Yeah. Yeah, that's neat. Mm-hmm. And I've done that before and it's kind of fun. Mm-hmm. But if you're like really into wanting, you know, like, oh, I love the way that my, my iPhone makes HDR pictures and I just want that out of my camera. Mm-hmm. Man, you just set this thing to live HDR all the time, and boom, there you go. I guess what's cool about this stuff is that, you know, on the phone, it's kind of frustrating because you basically can't turn it off. Like, mm-hmm. like yeah, it's a big deal with the iPhone 15 Pro being able to do the, uh, you know, the raw video, or you're, you're not doing as much of that. But because sometimes you don't want all that processing, but it's cool if you have those features, but you can turn them on or off at will. So if you want to get some cool shots, you can, but if you want to be more of a purist and not have the camera trying to do all this intelligent stuff. You also have that option. It's neat to have both. It, 
I agree. I think it is kind of cool. So like those are that's it. Those like those are the big features. We talked about video a little bit. I think like when we were talking about that 4K 60 stuff in a previous episode about how like the 10 bit versus the 8 bit and like dealing with it in log and it's all kind of dumb. Mm-hmm. The video out of this camera is fine. It has a really good IBIS. You basically have to shoot in the 10 bit log if you want it to look good at all. Whatever. I think that this is primarily a photo camera. That's kind of what it sounds like. And it is a, it's a travel, it's a travel photo camera. Mm-hmm. It is a light, keep it with you, easy. I mean, I don't know. Do you, are you any more interested now after we've t- like spent like 30 minutes on OM systems and the OM1 Mark II and like what are they doing and where they're going and why you'd buy into Micro Four Thirds? And how expensive is this camera? $2,400. I mean, to me, that's, that's the hard sell on it. I, I can see what they're going for. I mean, having gone through this, I understand, you know, how they're trying to differentiate. I think there's some interesting stuff there. But the problem is, I mean, even though like this camera has really cool features, but this camera is not designed as like a small form factor camera, you know, like I think it has a a fairly beefy grip and all that. And, um, you know, so this isn't going to be pocketable in the same way that, you know, something like, let's say, an X106 or whatever is. So, like, you lose a little bit of that capability. Um, I mean, it's probably easier to travel with than your Canon R6 Mark II or whatever. So, I guess that has that going for it. Um, but I guess I think it's neat that they're doing all this, but I just don't feel like it's a, it, it's not a camera that meets needs that I personally have. Yeah, that makes sense. It makes sense it's not exactly for you. Uh, just to, as a quick, check here the let's see if this one the other one's in millimeters oh no 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 oh no i got lost in all my tabs so an om1 mark ii is 3.6 by 5.3 by 2.9 and an r7 a7 r5 is 5.2 3.8 3.2 so it's it's about two inches wider no, no, it's not 3.5. They're basically the same size, give or take like a half an inch. So within a half an inch, not much smaller than an A7R5, which yeah. is 63 megapixel yeah. full frame camera, which the Sony's are like notoriously small. Yeah. Well, like it's the lenses, right? You're trying to get into micro four thirds because you're going to compare like a 24 to 70 Sigma, which is three sure. pounds versus a Lumix 10 to 25, 1.7, which like full frame equivalent 3.5 versus whatever it's going to weigh a third a third the amount yeah that's totally fair yeah and so maybe like it just depends on what you're doing if i was if i was like really outdoorsy and i was a hiker and like that was my main thing was i'm going to shoot landscapes i'm going to like carry all my gear for miles and miles and miles and i just need to get the best image quality i can with the lightest kit I mean, I think that's exactly what they're selling this to. Yeah. I I mean, and that is a market. So, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully, hopefully they'll be able to meet that. I mean, I'd like to, I'd like to see more competition. I'd like to see them succeed. Um, I hope that's not too niche in terms of what people are looking for, but uh, I think you're right. I think the camera does make sense for that use case. Yeah. I would like to see, I would like to see as kind of the years go on and OM tries to differentiate themselves as a brand can keep Micro Four Thirds alive and you know, develop into their own company out of Olympus's shadow. I want to see them like really make a name for themselves as this is the outdoor person's camera. This thing is rugged and really, really good and has all the features that your smartphone has. And it's it's lighter and like you're just going to have a better experience with yeah. this compared to buying like an R6 or an A7 R5. And like, you know, it's sure it's $2,500, but you know, it's not going to break or, you know, in a dust storm whenever you're, you know, and Kilimanjaro or something. Yeah. I mean, it'd be cool to have that as an option and have it be competitive and current and, you know, equally capable of some of these bigger cameras that people can legitimately choose that. I want to see them start doing ads where they start doing really insane things with it. Like I want to see them freeze it in a block of ice <laughs> and then like break the ice cube, take it out and then take a picture. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. That's yeah, okay. they really do need to lean into that whole adventure thing. You mm-hmm. know, like I kind of think about how like Rivian, for example, is the EV for adventure stuff. Yeah. They've really branded around that idea. And I think people have kind of responded to that. And it kind of feels like Olympus should do the same thing with these cameras. Make it into the travel oh, camera. OM digital systems. <laughs> and there's the problem. <laughs> yes. It's it's a hard name. It's yeah. a hard name. Yeah. 
But yes, I, they need to become the GoPro of mirrorless cameras. Yeah. And I think that would be really cool. I think it would too. They need a cooler name is the problem. Like GoPro is pretty good. Yeah. OM systems does not, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't evoke any feeling. It's kind of weird. Maybe if they started using like the OM abbreviation to mean different things, depending upon who they're advertising to. I don't know about that. I don't have any really good examples. <laughs> I was trying to think of like Overland something. Yeah. That didn't quite I work. I don't know. It sounds very, uh, OM, OM system just sounds very like proper and technical and kind OM of. OM digital system. It sounds kind of bland, I guess. I don't yeah. Know. I I get like the OM was like the whole brand name for Olympus and it's all OM. I don't know what the OM stands for. And it can maybe they, I, they had to do something with the branding. It's not a cool name. Yeah. Red's a cool name. I like Lumix. Lumix is good. Mm -hmm. Fuji's good. You know, Nikon isn't even a word. Canon's a word. That's a good name. Canon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Canon's a good name. I, come on. Yeah. Maybe they need to do another rebranding. They're like, this one probably hasn't taken. No one knows what an OM is. Yep. They could rebrand. Yep. I mean, let's go with JIP. They could put JIP <laughs> on the front of this thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be into it. Is that a JIP? <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> you're shooting on your jip and then you jump in your jeep and drive away <laughs> it's gonna jip deep that's it for the show today thanks for joining us and if you liked it tell a friend so they can check it out too you can find out more about the show at www.cameragearpodcast.com and you can find us on twitter at camera gear pod we'll be back with more next week <laughs>